Welcome to Worship C2. You're across the, just across the courtyard here. It's so wonderful to see you this morning. And I know that there are a dozen different countries represented today. We are your church, whether you are here or on the other side of the pond or down in South America. Welcome to worship today. We're so glad you've come. And for those of you still worshiping at home, we are one body here in Christ, united in faith. In just a few moments, I'll be sharing a message about the gospel that you heard today. But first, very briefly, this is the Sunday when my predecessor always did the Sermon on the Amount. <clears throat> so let me say this. I simply want to say, as God has blessed you generously through this very long and difficult time, if you have been spiritually fed here, then please make a pledge to this church, even if you've never done so before. If you come here once a year for a week or two weeks or six months and you've not ever made a pledge, do so. If you're at home or you're across the sea and you've been spiritually fed through this long time when we've been apart, you can go online and there's a give button on our website. Because I'll tell you, there are many churches around this country that will close just like your favorite restaurant did post-pandemic. And there are legions of ministers who have left the ministry because they said, I was not trained for such a time as this. And so I simply invite you, if you haven't, give. If you've given, give more according to your capacity. And God will continue to bless you through this church so that all God's people might know the good news that Christ is with us and receive the hope, forgiveness, and love and abundant life God intends. That is the shortest sermon on the amount you will ever hear. <laughs> Please pray with me. We thank you, God, for your love for all that you have made. We are thank you. We just are, we cannot help but be so overwhelmed with gratitude that you have given us life and breath to rise from sleep, whether home or in-house, to worship you and give you thanks and praise for every single day we have to live. Thank you. Today's story brings us a difficult word, O Lord, and so we ask that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to experience your love made known to us this day, your grace, mercy, and peace that covers us with hope. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be an acceptable offering, for you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a story about a little girl who had a gold chain around her neck and she had a, a shiny gold cross. Some of you wear one just like it. And uh, she was really proud of it. And her pastor came up to her one day after Sunday school and said, you know, that's really pretty, and I, I just really want you to know that um, Jesus died on a cross that didn't look like that. It was wooden, and it was very rough, and it was very hard, and it was a hard death for him, and the cross reminds us of that. And she said, oh, I know that. I know that, but they told me in Sunday school that whatever Jesus touches, Jesus changes. Everything Jesus touches, Jesus changes. Everything Jesus touches, he changes. Everything Jesus touches receives a gift. Everything Jesus touches leads to life. In today's story, Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And we can only imagine how having been touched by Jesus, his life must have changed, seeing for the first time ever. It's a story about a life changed by Jesus. We almost miss the point, because that's not where this story begins. Jesus and his disciples are walking along together, and they encounter this man who is born blind. Now you'd think, but they were not the least bit curious about what it would take for this man to be healed. Instead, they treat the man as if he were an object to be discussed in case not only could he not see, but he couldn't hear. They're talking about him right in front of him rather than a person to be made well. 
So the first thing they do is they play the, the blame game. Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus quickly says, neither. His disability is not his fault. Now, it's tempting to dismiss this story as irrelevant for our time. I mean, a couple of thousand years ago, nobody knew anything about viruses or bacteria, and they believed, according to their tradition, that if you had a disability or you were sick, somebody must have sinned, and they were looking around to see who needed to repent so that the person who was suffering could be made well. It's curious, though, that the disciples played the blame game because they didn't know better, while we who think we know better still play the game. This blame game continued in verses we didn't hear this morning. In between, it's a very long passage, the Pharisees started arguing about whether or not anything good could come out of Galilee, and how did Jesus have authority to heal him, and who must have sinned in the family. They were fighting about it, and they didn't see at all the fact that there was a miracle that took place and somebody was made well. I'd like to say that we've evolved as humans and we don't do this kind of blaming of one of another and, uh, anymore, but if you have listened to the news at all in the last week, you would think that I was daft if I said that. There's one particular ad I wanted to point out on television this week. It's a young man, you may have seen him, sitting in his living room talking to the camera. He suffers from depression. And he urges those watching to quit blaming him for his illness. He says, depression can be an overly tough thing to go through. And he says, unfortunately, people always have a lot of ideas on how to help you through. And then the camera shifts to snapshots of his well-meaning yet indirectly blaming friends. You just got to snap out of it. You have so much to be happy about. It's all in your head. Cheer up. Think of all the people who have it worse than you do. And then there's a sign over his head that says, unhelpful. Though this ad doesn't say so directly, the intention is clear. If you're depressed, you're not to blame, regardless of what your well-meaning friends may say. It's not your fault. And then the ad goes on to tell you where you can get real therapy and real help so that you can be healed. Jesus said, you are not to blame. I've heard people say about those who have COVID or who have had it, she should have avoided crowds. I bet he got it at the grocery store. He didn't get a vaccine and should have. She got a vaccine and booster and shouldn't have. People have different stories to tell about that, do they not? If you got COVID or you get COVID, it's not your fault. We didn't create this virus, and we're all part of a grand scientific experiment to figure out how to be made well. At the moment, thanks be to God, it looks like we're on a hopeful path. Now, to be sure, we humans sometimes contribute to being unwell through our lifestyle choices. That's, that's true. Nevertheless, that's not the same thing as being blamed for it. People who are out to find fault seldom find anything else. A psychologist once wrote, all blame is a waste of time. No matter how much fault we find with somebody else, regardless of how much we blame them, it will not change you. The only thing blame does is keep the focus off of us when we're looking for external reasons to explain our unhappiness or our frustration over something we want to change and can't. We might succeed in making somebody else feel guilty of something by blaming them, but that won't succeed in changing whatever it is about us that makes us unhappy. Faithful people get sick. People who take care of themselves get sick. Whenever I catch a common cold, somebody says, you haven't taken a day off lately and you haven't had enough sleep. People who get plenty of sleep and live a relatively stress-free life sometimes get sick. When the world goes to hell in a handbasket, as it did this week, many of you might say, it appears that there are people casting around for two who's to blame. 
I watched every news source yesterday. There's a finger pointing that goes in every possible direction. Who caused the war in the Ukraine? Who's to blame for the Russian advance? Who should have done this? Who could have prevented that? Finger pointing has become a national hobby, has it not? Some even have blamed the Ukrainians for not better protecting themselves and already being equipped with a better army. Jesus was pretty clear in this passage today. The one who suffers is not to blame. When Jesus touches you, he will change you. And the first thing he will say to you is, it's not your fault. The second thing he'll say is, it's not God's fault either. When we don't blame each other, which we do often enough, we humans tend to blame God. In the person of Jesus Christ, God came to talk with us about faith, about forgiveness of sins, and the path to a full and abundant life. Concerning our faith, he said we would have a fulfilling and abundant life if we trust him, if we follow him, if we teach others his ways by our word and example, by how we love, by how we're compassionate, and how we're kind. When we do these things, the world will be a better place. Jesus said if we would just accept his grace for our past mistakes, allow ourselves to be forgiven, and learn to be gracious with others, oh, how much better this world would be. So we're not going to blame God for cancer or diabetes or COVID or any other disease or malady that affects humankind. They weren't part of God's created order. God hates them as much as we do. God works along with us to defeat them. And on occasion, God reveals power through a healing miracle, a ray of hope for the homeless, a sign and a promise of healing that will come for all people because we know, as people of faith, that whether we live or whether we die, we are all made well, we are all healed, both now and for glory. In like manner, we don't blame God for accidents. God doesn't cause accidents. Accidents come with the territory of freedom. When we suffer, God suffers with us. Our pain is God's pain. When we complain to God, and God doesn't mind when we do, it doesn't really hurt God's feelings so much. When we complain, when we say, where were you when I needed you? I think God says in a still, small voice, I was there hurting with you. Jesus wondered where God was when he was dying on the cross. My God, my God, he cried, why did you let me down? We know God was not on a leave of absence while Jesus was dying. God in Christ suffered the pains of vulnerable love. Sometimes it hurts. Jesus is not interested in blaming you for what's causing your suffering. And if you are not suffering now, you have at some point. Or you know by virtue of being human that you will again. And Jesus isn't at all interested in our passing the buck to God. But what Jesus does do, and this is the point of the story that those Pharisees missed, is that Jesus asks us to respond with profound gratitude for the miracles that God does for all of us through every breath-filled day. God gives us the capacity to get up and eat when someone we love has died. God gives us the capacity to go and take something to a neighbor who's sick, even though we've just recovered from the same thing and we barely have the energy. God is with us in a a miracle of every breath-filled day. And Jesus asks us to take responsibility for our part in being healed. He sent the man born blind to wash the mud from his eyes at the pool of Siloam. He said, we have a a part to play. The man could not see until he went and washed his eyes. It wasn't enough that there was mud and spit from Jesus on it. He had to do something about it. He had to respond to the love that had been offered to him. When Jesus touched him, Jesus changed him. When Jesus changes you, you behave in new ways. You stop blaming other people for your problems or their problems. 
You're changed by getting curious now about what God is trying to tell you in your difficult circumstance. Your prayer is different. Not, God, why did you do this? But, God, what would you like me to understand about what I'm going through right now that I might be made well? Jesus changes us. He changes the questions we ask. Our prayers aren't like text messages. We say, God, I want this, and God texts back with the answer right away. We say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. No, when we're curious and we're open and we're prayerful, God will reveal to us what it is that needs to be made well, and God will equip us with what is needed for that to happen. When we are touched, we are changed. Like the man born blind, You confess your belief that the God who created all things is creating still once you've been touched. The God who is creating creating still will walk with you as you do the hard work of recovering from whatever's got you down, whenever you're down. And if you are not down today, just go home rejoicing, dance your way to your car, and thank God for the preciousness of this joy. Jesus had to work really hard. He pushed the detractors aside and he healed a man who then confessed his belief in Jesus as the Messiah. Healed from physical blindness, he was also now able to see a spiritual truth. And those Pharisees who claim to know spiritual truth, well, that's where this story twists, as Jesus' stories often do. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do say, those who think they see, those who think they know it all, well, they become the blind. Some of the Pharisees near Jesus heard this and said to him, surely we are not the ones who are blind, are we? You see, Jesus didn't fit with their understanding of the world. How could something good come out of Nazareth? Who was this nobody rabbi healing people? How could anybody be healed without somebody in the family repenting of their sin? This was a cognitive dissonance. That's what psychologists call it, where what we think doesn't match up with what we're seeing. But we still continue to believe what we believed previously, despite the fact that we have new information. A certain woman named Anna resided in Charlottesville, Virginia for years. She said she was Anastasia Romanoff, the daughter of the last czar of Russia. Many people in Charlottesville believed her. After she died, researchers located the remains of her DNA, and they compared it with the DNA of other members of the Romanoff family in the United States and in Europe. The result was that she was not Anastasia and was not a member of the Romanov family. Yet when one of her neighbors who believed strongly that she was Anastasia was told, he immediately responded, I don't believe it. And he began to give several reasons why the DNA must be mistaken. We reject information, we reject facts every day when they don't confirm our long-held beliefs. And no amount of evidence can convince us otherwise. If we don't believe something's possible, then it is not possible for us. This closes us off from the new information, the new knowledge, the new way of being that God would have for us, the resources that are available to us, because we are blind to other possibilities. It cuts us off from other human beings because we, have, we think we know. We've got them in a box about what they ought to do and how they ought to live and how they ought to think, and we don't get to experience them as beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. We reject the fact that God blesses people indiscriminately, not just the ones we think ought to be blessed. The religious establishment of Jesus' day refused to acknowledge that this Galilean Jewish rabbi could actually do anything good, no matter the outcome. Too frequently, we get confused. We confuse persons with strong beliefs with persons who have deep faith. It's not the same thing. Persons with strong beliefs 
puff themselves up in order to be heard and recognized. They uphold tradition and they oppose innovation because they weren't the ones who thought of it. They confess their loyalty to a loving and gracious God, but they themselves are unloving and ungracious. They own the center of the stage. And when pressed, they always do what is expedient or what is convenient. That was the Pharisees. That was their behavior. That's what Jesus observed when he said, there are those who think they see but are now blind. By contrast, people with deep faith affirm their tradition, but they're open to the new perspectives that God is revealing to them. They're open to new methods without being threatened. They're open to the ways that God is still speaking in the world. They take to heart God's amazing grace and God's amazing love and believe that they must mirror God's grace and love in their own lives for the sake of the world. They do not do what is expedient or convenient. They do what is right, regardless of how it might look or who might oppose them. This is a powerful passage today. In conclusion, sometimes we humans are slow to trust God's power. That's what Jesus wants us to know. We, we're slow to trust, but there are miracles occurring all around us every day for those of us who are open to it. So as you go your way this day, may Jesus touch you. May Jesus change you. And may God open your eyes to see and your heart to believe. Thanks be to God. Amen.